Welcome to a conversation about voting equity for people with disabilities. I'm Joy Cardine. I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin and your moderator today as we talk with members of the Wisconsin Disability Vote Coalition, representatives of three organizations that work collaboratively to reduce barriers to voting for people with disabilities. This afternoon, we will hear from the Executive Director of the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired, Denise Jess, the Director of the Milwaukee Office of Disability Rights Wisconsin, Barbara Beckert, and the Voter Education Manager of the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin, Eileen Newcomer. What brings us together today to talk about this effort is the Big Share, a day-long online giving event hosted by Community Shares of Wisconsin. All three of the organizations represented today are members of Community Shares of Wisconsin. You can support them and dozens of other of area nonprofits by visiting the Big Share website at thebigshare.org. We will share websites and other resources in the comments section of the Facebook feed you are watching right now, and we will invite you to post any questions you have about voting equity for people with disabilities in the comments section as well, and I will present your questions to our panelists a little later on. So let's get our conversation started by hearing from our panelists about who they are and what they and their organizations do. We'll start with Denise Jess with the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired. Good afternoon, Denise. Good afternoon, Joy, and good uh, afternoon, everyone who is tuning in. Thanks so much for being here. I'm Denise Jess, the Executive Director of the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired, and I am a person who lives with disabilities, uh, having been legally blind since birth. So I bring that lived experience to uh, my work and to our conversation today. Uh, the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired is proud to be celebrating our 70th anniversary this year. Uh, we were found in 1952 with the mission to promote the dignity and empowerment of people in Wisconsin living with vision loss. And we do that in three primary ways, advocacy uh, at the policy level, um, education to help reduce bias, and vision services to teach the necessary skills to live um, a full life with blindness and vision impairment. So thanks so much, Joy, for uh, helping us along today. My pleasure. Let's turn next to Barbara Beckert with Disability Rights Wisconsin. Hello, Barbara. Thank you, Joy, and great to be here with all of you for this important conversation today. Disability Rights Wisconsin is the federally mandated protection and advocacy system for our state, and we are charged with protecting the voting rights of people with disabilities, including ensuring that they have the opportunity to fully participate in the electoral process. To do that, we staff a voter hotline uh, that assists people with disabilities, their family members, service providers, and older adults. We do a lot of policy work and coalition work is central to that. DRW and the Wisconsin Board for People with Developmental Disabilities coordinate the Wisconsin Disability Vote Coalition together. And uh, as a coalition, we provide training and resources to voters with disabilities, their families and service providers. So the hotline and training really provide us with a frontline perspective, which informs the policy work that we do. And now let's uh, turn to Eileen Newcomer with the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin. Welcome Eileen. Thank you so much, Joy. I'm so good to see you here moderating uh, the discussion today. And hi to everyone who's joining us on Facebook. I'm Eileen Newcomer, Voter Education Manager for the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin. And for those who might not be familiar with us, so we are a nonpartisan nonprofit organization of women and men committed to making voting free, fair, and accessible for all. Our mission is to empower voters and defend democracy. And we know that our democracy works better when everyone is able to participate. And when our uh, representatives are reflect and are responsive to the communities that they serve. And we're a really proud partner of the Disability Vote Coalition and know that we're able to do so much more when we work together in solidarity. Um, and being part of the coalition is one of the ways that we live out our mission to empower all voters um, and defend democracy. So. 
happy to be part of this panel and uh, ask back to join. Well, thanks to all of you for being here today and for all the work you do, including your participation in the Wisconsin Disability Vote Coalition. Let's start in general. Uh, Denise, what are the voting rights of people with disabilities? Thanks, Joy. It's a really great place to start. So for those of us with disabilities, just as every other qualified voter, we have the right to vote privately and independently and for our vote to be securely cast. So, you know, that is no different than any other voter. However, there are um, so many systemic and um, procedural and physical challenges to voting that um, statute both on the federal and state level has been put in place um, to help reduce some of those barriers to voting that are both historical and that are still existing today. So it's really vital for all of us with disabilities. Um, that's why this is work is so important to the council to know what our rights are so that we can advocate for them. We can ask for them when uh, we're not having our rights met and we can um, um, and help um, advocate for them for all voters with disabilities. And so important for our family members, our caregivers, um, and uh, election officials and community members to understand those rights as well. So um, because we have the right to vote, period, um, it is just vitally important to know that every voter with disabilities who's qualified to vote has the right to vote unless that has been taken away through a competency hearing in court. And often we hear stories of uh, folks who have family members or caregivers or even um, elections officials, poll workers, who uh, question their right to vote vote because of their disability status. So you may vote um, unless that has been um, revoked through um, a guardianship hearing or competency hearing. We have the right to vote privately and independently, and that includes being able to get into the polling place. So having uh, disability spots available, parking spaces available um, for folks that need them, being able to move from the parking area um, through the sidewalk area ramped properly and into the building. And that includes proper snow removal, you know, at times when that needs to happen, needs, you know, sidewalks are, are free from um, um, debris or, you know, building materials or whatever, and so that we can get safely into the building. And once in the building, that there is um, an accessible route for anyone using any sort of mobility device to get uh, to the actual polling place. Um, and the actual voting booths. Once we're in the polling place, other uh, rights that we have access to are making sure that we can use any accessible voting equipment. Wisconsin law uh, states that all voting equipment needs to be in every polling place, and yet we know that that doesn't consistently happen across our state. So that equipment needs to be set up needs to have been tested before um, you know, the voter goes to use it and needs to make sure that it is functional. And really our hope is that um, folks are trained in how to use that equipment, uh, because oftentimes we'll encounter elections officials that don't know how to use it. And then <laughs> there's been lots of times I've instructed elections officials on how to <laughs> use the accessible equipment. So. Um, the, in addition to that, we have the right to ask for reasonable accommodation. So potentially we might ask for a chair to sit down. Um, if we need to, we should have the right to ask for a magnifying glass if we need it, or a signature guide to sign the poll book. Um, if we have difficulty in stating our names, uh, we should have an accommodation for that. There should be pen and paper available. So anyone with a hearing impairment um, or hearing disability or a speech um, disability is able to write um, and communicate with poll workers in that way. 
Additionally, we have the right for assistance. So um, anyone can assist us of our choosing um, if to complete the ballot. And so if we want to have a family member do that, if we ask for a poll worker to assist with that, um, anyone who is not our employer or our union representative has the ability to serve as our uh, sister. And we've heard from folks that when poll workers have said, oh, I can't help you with your ballot. Um, and that is actually inaccurate. Um, the last thing I think I'll highlight is that if we can't access the polling place um, because of disability, Wisconsin statute does call for curbside voting. So we have the right to utilize that, um, you know, that accessibility accommodation and uh, curbside voting should be made available for the voter and, um, and clearly indicated how the voter should access it. And if you're at all concerned about whether your polling place will have curbside voting or how it works, we really highly recommend you contact your clerk in advance. So that on the higher level um, are some of the really fundamental rights and the provisions that are in law to um, assist that we can vote privately and independently. Thank you, Denise. Um, very, uh, very complete and complex. Uh, let's, uh, Barbara, go to you. What, what barriers to voting has the Wisconsin Disability Vote Coalition successfully removed or, or prevented from being put in place? Uh, I think collaboration and coalition building is so key when it comes to addressing some of the pretty significant barriers that voters with disabilities experience. So happy to share a few examples. So I'll start out with uh, one legislative example. So in the November 2018 election, Disability Rights Wisconsin through our voter hotline happened to receive a number of calls in that election from deaf voters who were experiencing barriers to voting. Wisconsin has a law that requires voters to speak their name and address at their polling place in order to receive a ballot. And most deaf people don't speak vocally. They may use ASL or communicate uh, in other ways. We also receive this complaint from some other voters who had difficulty communicating because of their disability. And there were some pretty um, significant situations that we heard about, one from a young man who was deaf, who was told that if he didn't speak his name, he wouldn't get his ballot and wouldn't get to vote. Well, we were outraged by that. And um, with the work from the Disability Vote Coalition and the different partners, and um, with the leadership of Ramsey Lee, who is a self-advocate and a person with a disability who people sometimes have difficulty understanding and who was pretty charged up about this issue, we were able to get legislation drafted and it was passed unanimously in the state legislature, um, which is something that isn't happening very often these days on voting bills. So that was a really positive thing. And uh, we were able to come together the next year, took about a year uh, and uh, River Falls for a bill signing uh, with both the lead sponsors of the bill and, and as well as with Governor Evers. And there was a great turnout from the disability community there. So good celebration. So that was one thing that we were really proud to get across the finish line. Uh, some other areas where we've collaborated that are a little bit of a work in progress still. Um, photo ID is a requirement to vote in Wisconsin. And Wisconsin has one of the most restrictive photo ID requirements in the country. This is a especially difficult for a lot of people with disabilities because so many are non-drivers and the primary form of photo ID is a driver's license. If you don't have a driver's license, you can get a state ID for voting, but if you don't drive, getting to the DMV can be difficult. There aren't many locations and the hours are limited and um, some are only open, particularly in rural areas, a few days a week. So people have trouble getting there. So um, one, initiative that we worked on during the pandemic because DMV locations were closed for, for a long time was in advance of the election, uh, ensuring that more DMV locations were open and that there were longer hours and some Saturday hours. So that was something that we were able to work with um, Department of Transportation Secretary Craig Thompson and his team on that. And we continue to have discussions with them because the job is not done. Access is still a challenge. 
in terms of voters and care facilities, that's an area as well where it's been very disturbing to see coverage uh, in the media as a result of some of the investigations that has really, um, we think, uh, marginalized the voting rights of care facility residents. And as Denise pointed out a minute ago, uh, people who live in a nursing home, people with disabilities in the community, they have the right to vote unless they have legally been declared incompetent and have had that right taken away by a court. So in terms of coalition action, we've been able to provide training about those voting rights. And we also were able to release a statement that was signed onto by over 35 organizations affirming the rights of care facility residents to vote as well as people with disabilities in the community. And we hope that that has been helpful in educating community members as well as our policymakers. Excellent. Let me um, talk a little bit about absentee voting. How important, Denise, is absentee voting for people with disabilities? Thanks, Joy. Uh, the absentee voting is a critical uh, right for voters with disabilities and older adults as well. So as Barbara mentioned, you know, many uh, folks with disabilities, including myself, you know, are unable to drive. And in Wisconsin, our non-driving population is about 30%, so nearly 2 million people. So that's a significant number. Um, and a good portion of folks that don't drive are older adults and people with disabilities. So being able is in our rural communities, particularly to be able to drive to the polls, um, especially if they're outside a walkable distance, safe walkable distance is you know, you often have to drive to get to the polls, you have to drive to get your ID, all of those things. Um, so having the ability to work to vote absentee allows folks to not have to manage the transportation barrier. Voting absentee is also very critical for anyone uh, with, you know, with significant mobility um, issues, because if you are able to secure a ride and you need specialized transportation, like a wheelchair accessible van, um, those are few and far between, again, particularly in our rural areas. So you may secure the ride, but you can't you know, get yourself and your mobility device into the vehicle. So again, absentee, voting uh, alleviates that barrier. For folks that are health compromised, you know, might have, um, you know, MS or other, you know, chronic illnesses. And so feeling fine one day, but then another day really feeling, um, you know, very ill or difficulty with mobility, um, you know, being able to vote absentee allows uh, folks to know that they can cast their ballot and it isn't, they aren't dependent on whether they're feeling well enough that day. And uh, a lot of folks with disabilities are very isolated. Um, so, you know, may live alone, may not have an immediate family member, may not have um, a care provider um, or a neighbor who can provide that transportation. And so because of that isolation, transportation barriers um, and um, illness um, and, you know, for a firm, you know, being uh, well enough to vote, Having access to the absentee ballot is so incredibly, incredibly critical. There have been some new rules when it comes to absentee ballots. Eileen, how do we get absentee ballots and when and how should they be returned? Yeah, that's a great question, Joy. Um, first, I want to start by saying that here in Wisconsin, there's no excuse needed in order to request an absentee ballot. So you don't need to prove that you have a disability. You don't need to prove that you're gonna be out of town. It's if you want the flexibility to vote by mail, you can request an absentee ballot. And you can do that um, online on the MyVote website or by sending um, a written re request to your clerk that can be a letter or an email. Um, and so once you do that, you do have to uh, show your photo ID in order to um, submit your request with your clerk. Um, but then, the, the, so there's also uh, the ability for people with uh, who are indefinitely confined due to um, age, uh, illness, infirmity, or disability, they can request to be on the permanent absentee ballot list. And those folks do not need to uh, 
submit a photo ID in order to be on that list. Um, so there, there are two different ways to request a ballot, uh, an absentee ballot, essentially. Um, and the, but you can do both online. Uh, we do recommend that you put in your request at least two weeks in advance of the election, um, but you can re request the start of the year to receive absentee ballots for the entire year. Um, and the reason why we uh, suggest that you give at least two weeks uh, for your request to go in is to give enough time for your ballot to be mailed to you, for you to fill it out, and also to give enough time to return it. So Joy, as you mentioned, the rules have changed a little bit um, for absentee voters for the April election. Um, for this election, you will not be able to use drop boxes. So if you do plan to vote absentee, um, you know, make your plan to uh, return your ballot uh, through the mail and you know, at least a week in advance of the election or return it to your clerk's office um, or your polling place on election day. Or if you are in a municipality that has a central count um, as the counting process for uh, processing absentee ballots, you will wanna plan to return your absentee ballot to the central count location if you're returning it on election day. So you just, you should plan ahead a little bit to make sure that you know which, uh, or I guess, which way you're going to return your ballot so that you can make sure that it's there and counted on election day. And if possible, um, due to this rule change, you wanna make sure that you are the one who's physically uh, putting your ballot in the mail or uh, returning it to your clerk's office. Now, if for some reason um, you're not able to do that, for example, if you have a disability that will make it so that you can't be the one to physically put your ballot in the mail, um, do reach out to your clerk and you can ask for an accommodation in order to return your ballot. But again, this is something that you'll wanna plan ahead and just you know communicate with your clerk about to make sure that you understand the rules. You know, um, Denise had mentioned all sorts of different um, barriers that people with disabilities face when they go to a polling place or, uh, for that matter, absentee um, uh, uh, voting. How can people be supportive of the voting rights of people with disabilities, Eileen? Yeah, Denise touched on a, a bunch of things that I think a, it's really important to just be aware of what the rights are for people with disabilities and um, to think through what are ways that you can be supportive, just like you said, Joy. So, for example, if you go to vote in person and uh, there are things blocking the door or blocking the path of travel, if you mention that to the poll workers, they can clean that up and clear it up and make sure that um, the path of travel is accessible. Denise also mentioned the importance of the accessible voting equipment at the polling sites. And if you choose to use that equipment um, at your polling place to cast your ballot, that helps um, ensure, first of all, that the equipment is set up and working at your polling place, helps ensure that the poll workers at your polling place know how to use the equipment. And it also makes it so that when, absent, or when um, the ballots are being processed and counted, there are more ballots that have been marked by that machine than just the uh, ballots that have been um, marked by people with disabilities. And so it adds a little bit more um, the layer of anonymity to, uh, to ballots. Ooh, that word was tough for me today. <laughs> uh, but I'm sure people know what I, what I mean. Um, and then I think there's a few other things that people can do. Sign up to be a poll worker and put um, some of these concerns on the radar of your clerk. And during training, make sure that um, the stuff is being covered and that your fellow poll workers know what the rights are people with disabilities and make sure that um, the polling place is ready to accommodate voters with disabilities. Um, you can also uh, sign up to be an election observer. So the league runs an election observation program where we have uh, people go and observe um, what's going on at polling places on election day. And one of the really great collaborations that we've been able to do with the Disability Vote Coalition is make sure to include um, more elements of accessibility as part of the uh, reporting form that we ask observers to look out for. So that's another way to go and ensure that um, polling places are, are more accessible. You know, I am a poll worker and I'm very um, proud to be one. And I had an experience 
oh, oh this was a few years ago that um, a gentleman did ask me if I would read the ballot to him because he <laughs> he couldn't read it or you know he had a hard time seeing it. I'm not sure exactly uh, what the situation was, but the chief um, inspector for the polling place. Uh, set him up on on one of these um, special machines that would read the ballot to him. Uh, Denise, is that is that what you use? Oh, it is what I use. Yeah. Yep. So we, the city of Madison, um, city of Milwaukee, actually every polling place in the state should have accessible voting equipment, and it will in a different forms of it. But um, the what the equipment will do, you'll wear headphones similar to the ones I have on here. Um, you'll insert your ballot, so it is not um, you know it's a, still a balloting process. And I think that's really important for folks to know because people get kind of squeamish, like, am I going to actually have a ballot? You have a physical ballot. It's inserted into the machine. Um, you hear your the candidates um, are read um, using automated speech. Um, also, there's a, still a screen um, output, and that can be the font size can be increased on that to be larger. And then for um, folks who are not able to interact with the screen, like I can't interact with the screen because I can't really see it. There's also a controller. And um, so I can make my ballot selection by using that controller and then I can review my ballot. So I hear it back again to make sure I've um, at, you know, accurately marked it. And then when I feel satisfied with the ballot, I can hit print, the ballot comes out of the, vote, the piece of voting equipment and then I bring my ballots to the tabulator. So just to really demystify that, and, and to really emphasize the point that Eileen made is that those um, the accessible voting equipment, while it's there by law for folks like me to use, it is you can be used by any voter who chooses to use it. It's not just like just for those of us who um, who need it. And we hear that from um, voting officials around the state of that equipment is for those people. And, um, and it can be for anyone. So I would really encourage everybody to use um, the accessible voting equipment in their polling place at least once so that it demystifies it for you. And, uh, and then you can, you know, become an advocate for others to use it. Let's talk a little bit about some of the future goals of the Disability Rights Coalition and, and what's next, what you um, hope to be working on next. Uh, Denise? Sure, I'll pick up on one of our um, goals and I'll circle back to the absentee voting process. So when our absentee ballots come in the mail in Wisconsin, as we all know, they're um, in print form and the print on them, just like the ballot at the polling place is itty bitty. And so for uh, me and for many other Wisconsinites who cannot see, read or physically mark the ballot, we cannot vote absentee on our own. We have to have assistance. And uh, so our right for that privacy and independence is, 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 is it's not, it's not honored. And so I have to find someone that I trust to mark my ballot who will accurately read it to me. And there are folks in the state who do not have family members or neighbors that they trust to accurately read the ballots to them, accurately mark the ballot, and then um, you know hand it back to the voter to put into the certification envelope. So uh, we have been working uh, in the through the Vote Coalition and through the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired to uh, raise the, the request for an accessible absentee ballot. And what that would look like is that it, it, upon request, the clerk would be able to electronically send me a ballot. I could then interact with it with my screen reading software so I could hear what's on the ballot. I could use my computer to mark the ballot and I could do that process completely independently. Um, in a perfect world, I could then submit it electronically because even the certification envelope has lots of barriers. Again, um, you know, teeny tiny, little tiny spot to sign, um, even difficult to place a signature guide um, and then 
have, you know, my witness and my uh, sister sign it. So uh, submitting it electronically would really remove all the barriers. So uh, we're also working with the Elections Commission to make a Braille ballot uh, more accessible or more available across the state. But we have to remember that only about two or three percent of people with vision impairment uh, read Braille. So really the electronic um, accessible ballot would be um, one of a really powerful tool for voters who need access to it. And I and my, I apologize for I misspoke. I uh, the future goals of the Wisconsin Disability Vote uh, Coalition is what uh, we were looking for. And um, Barbara, what about um, what are the future goals from your perspective? Uh, well, voters with disabilities are underrepresented at the ballot box. So first and foremost, the goal of our coalition is to make sure that we can increase uh, the number of voters with disabilities who are registered to vote, who cast a ballot, and who understand and assert their rights. Far too many people do not, and we're here to help them. We have a hotline that's available all year round. We encourage people, um, give us a call, send us an email, and we'll do whatever we can to help ensure that you can participate in the electoral process. We also have a lot of um, more modest goals as well. <laughs> um, first of all, uh, I think we want to ensure that more poll workers understand the rights of people with disabilities. Wisconsin has the most decentralized system in the country for voting uh, with 1800 municipal clerks, all of whom work very hard, but not all of whom train poll workers in a uniform way. So um, we would like to see requirements that poll workers complete training before serving and that there be some requirements on content that would cover disability rights and accommodations. So the kind of situation that we shared with you about the young man who was told he couldn't vote because he couldn't say his own name and address that's not right, that shouldn't happen, that's a civil rights violation. So we wanna end those kinds of things by providing more training. We also would like to expand access to photo ID in a few ways. As I mentioned, we would like to have more DMV locations, expanded access, mobile DMV, uh, so that people who can't go to the DMV location that's an hour from their home and they don't drive may be able to have it come to them. We'd also like to expand the options. Wisconsin is very restrictive as compared to other states in the types of uh, acceptable photo ID options. So we've got some great ideas that we would like to have policymakers work with us in advance and um, bring people together so that our elections are more accessible and inclusive. And that's just the beginning of the list. All right. And uh, Eileen, what about uh, from the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin's perspective in terms of future goals? Yeah, sure. Um, Denise and Barbara mentioned uh, quite a few things that, you know, we're all working on collaboratively. Um, I have a couple things that I could just add to the list. Um, one, in addition to what Barbara mentioned around poll worker training and um, ensuring that the rights of disabilities are is part of the training. We're also working to support clerks um, by helping recruit poll workers because we know when things are less hectic at the polls, when polling places are fully staffed, there is um, people are thinking more clearly and less uh, reactive to just you know the stressful environment of getting people through the line as quickly as possible. Um, one of the big roles that really helps voters with disabilities at the polls is having a greeter available yes. at um, polling places. So uh, having a greeter um, helps direct people to the right line, can help facilitate uh, curbside voting, um, and really plays a key role in kind of directing the flow of traffic in a polling place. And unfortunately, a lot of um, polling places don't have a greeter. And so that's something that, you know, once they're, they're fully staffed, that's in uh, a position that can be uh, somebody can be placed um, in that, that role. Um, another thing that I'm really excited that we're able to work on together is um, making voting more accessible to people with criminal convictions. So unfortunately, um, a lot of people with criminal convictions have disabilities. Um, and a lot of people don't know that there are folks who are in jail uh, for a misdemeanor who retain their right to vote, but are not able to access that right to vote. And then on the flip side of that, 
Uh, there are a bunch of people who um, have been convicted of a, a felony and have had their rights taken away, but then restored once they've completed their sentence. And they um, they don't vote because they are unaware uh, or maybe are confused about um, when their right to vote is restored. And so I'm really proud of the the work that we are we are doing together to um, make voting uh, more accessible to those folks. Well, the, the April 5th uh, spring election is is fast approaching and depending on where you live you could be electing a mayor or city council county board school board members judges why is it important to vote in these local elections Eileen yeah so um this April voters are going to be making really important decisions about the future of our courts of our schools and our local um, communities and um, local government really make a lot of decisions around um, our daily lives, whether it's public transit, school quality, affordable housing, um, policing and public safety, sanitation, job training programs, and so much more. And they also decide where a lot of our tax dollars are spent. And so if that's something that's important to you, then you should definitely plan on voting in the April election. Um, and also local officials, because they are your neighbors, they're more likely to uh, respond to concerns that you have at the local level. And so they can be, you know, really good advocates for you if, there is, if there's something that you would like to see changed in your community. You know, I often hear, though, from, from voters that they don't see these local races covered on, you know, TV 24-7, and they're not sure really who the candidates are or, or what they stand for, where, where can we get information about the local races? Eileen. Yep, I'm happy to answer that question. And I, I think that it is a real challenge to find uh, information, especially about um, the down ballot races. And that's one of the reasons why the league has put um, considerable energy behind providing candidate information um, through our voter guide on vote411.org. Um, we have many local leagues participating um, in putting together their candidate guides. And so that's a way to learn about your school board races or your mayoral races, city council races, um, and also statewide races as well. And then uh, they also work really hard at putting on candidate forums. Um, and so these are live events where it's, voters can come and they can ask questions of the candidates and, and learn from them. Um, one of the things that you can do is help uh, encourage candidates to participate uh, in these activities because it is so important that people who want to um, represent us in government are actually responsive to the people and let us know what is their plan once they're in office. Another uh, resource that I think is really important are the fact sheets that the Disability Vote Coalition has put together. And so one of the things that are, is a barrier for people in order to vote and feel like they're informed voters is they know that there are these local races coming up, but they don't really know what these offices do. Um, so we have worked collaboratively to create fact sheets um, that help explain what do these offices do and why are they important in our daily lives. And uh, I'm sure we'll be sharing out the link to where you can find those fact sheets, but they have been really a really helpful resource for people. Yeah, in fact, if there's, um, hopefully those links are being shared in your uh, Facebook Facebook comment sections. And if you have questions or experiences that you'd like to share, we we have a, a short time left here to uh, continue this conversation. Please post your your questions or experiences, and um, and I can share them with our with our panelists. Um, let me, what, what should we do if we encounter accessibility issues at polling places or um, we witness them? Um, Barbara, do you want to handle that one? Yes, thank you. I'd be happy to handle that one. So a few suggestions for what a voter should do. First, you would want to talk to the election inspector, the chief election inspector at your polling place and see if they can address it. Uh, and so that might take care of your immediate problem. Secondly, we hope that you will report this because it's important to get a record of this for the future. So one option is you can contact the Disability Rights Wisconsin voter hotline. We're at 844-347-8683. And 
um, we can assist you uh, both if you need help getting the complaint addressed right then and you haven't been successful talking to the local individual, we can work with you on that. And we also can assist you with making a complaint to the Wisconsin Election Commission. And it's important to make a complaint even if it's resolved because then it documents that there is an issue with accessibility. And then that can go on the record for the future. And our agency, Disability Rights Wisconsin, actually performs uh, polling place accessibility audits on election day on behalf of the Wisconsin Election Commission. We really value the partnership with them and they've prioritized the need to review the accessibility of our polling places. So our staff will go out as do their staff on election day and we do a very detailed review of polling place accessibility. So if you've reported a complaint that will let us know there might be an issue there and it could get on the list for the next ele election. So we hope to hear from people and uh, to assist them with getting their complaints resolved. And that's one of our asks for the future as well. We would like to see more resources put into review of polling place accessibility because we don't have that many people on our staff. We go out and maybe cover 50, hundred polling places, uh, you know, for a particular election. Well, if you look statewide with 1800 municipalities, we have thousands of polling places. So we would like to get an army of people out there reviewing those polling places. It's really needed. We really have an obligation to ensure that people do not have accessibility barriers to casting a ballot. Yeah. Well, let, Denise, let me ask you, um, maybe as we wrap things up, why? Why is it so important uh, for us to remove these barriers to voting for people with disabilities? Why is it, uh, you know, why is the, the work of the, the, the disability uh, vo voting coalition so vital? Yeah, thanks. It's a great question. So as people with disabilities, we bring value to our community. And I think often that gets forgotten. So we bring valuable life experience, we bring valuable perspective. And so uh, creating opportunity for us to fully participate in our uh, democracy is, is just a basic human right. And so when we remove those barriers, the value of the voices of people with disabilities can really be allowed to, to stand out, to, to speak um, for ourselves. There's an old saying in the disability rights community, nothing, without, nothing about us without us. And so we really need to have our right to vote um, honored and protected um, and the barriers to be removed so that we are a critical part of the decision-making uh, of our lives. Thank you all for joining us for this conversation about voting equity for people with disabilities. Thank you to the members of the Wisconsin Disability Vote Coalition, Denise Jess of the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired, Barbara Beckert with Disability Rights Wisconsin, and Eileen Newcomer from the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin. If you have been informed or inspired by this conversation, please take this opportunity to participate in the Big Share, which is happening all day today. It's a chance to support community share member organizations like these three organizations that are making a difference for people in Wisconsin by working for social justice, for equity, for environmental sustainability. You can learn more and you can give at thebigshare.org. I'm Joy Cardine. Thank you for being with us and thank you for caring about voting equity for people with disabilities.